happy as could kick. One evening, when I had gratefully accepted a cup of coffee, my wall-eyed friend sat down for a lecture. Cornelia, he said, settling his bulk on a velvet chair too small for him. I understand you have no alarm system in your house. This is purest folly. Also, I am given to believe that you are not carrying on regular drills for your guests. I was always amazed at how well Pickwick knew what went on at the Beijing. You know that a raid may come any day, Pickwick continued. I don't see how you can avoid one. Scores of people in and out, and the NSB agent living over, over, over cons up the street. Your secret room is no good to you if people can't get to it in time. I know this lean dirt. He's a good man and very possible, very passable electrician. Get him to put a buzzer in every room with a door or a window in the street. Then hold practice drills until your people can disappear in that room without a trace in less than a minute. I'll send someone to get you started. Lean Dirt did the electrical work that weekend. He installed the buzzer near, near the top of the stairs, loud enough to be heard all over the house, but not outside. Then he placed buttons to sound the buzzer at every vantage point where trouble might first be spotted. One button went beneath the dining hall, the dining room window sill, just below the mirror which gave onto the side, gave onto the side door. Another went in the downstairs hall just inside the door, and a third inside the front door in the bar. Bartle drawer strut. He also put a button behind the counter in the shop, and one on each workbench as well as beneath the windows in Tante John's rooms. We were ready for our first trial run. The four unacknowledged members of our household were already climbing up the secret room two times a day, in the morning to store their night clothes, bedding, and toilet articles, and in the evening to put away their day things. Members of our group, too, who had to spend the night, kept raincoats, hats, anything they had brought with them in that room. Altogether, that made a good deal of traffic in and out of my small bedroom, smaller now indeed by nearly a yard. Many nights my last waking sight would be Yusi in long robe and tasseled nightcap, handing his day clothes through the secret panel. But the purpose of the drills was to see how rapidly people could reach the room at any hour of the day or night without prior notice. A tall, sallow-faced young man arrived from Pickwick one morning to teach me how to conduct the drills. Smith, father exclaimed when the man introduced himself, Truly, it's most astonishing. I've had one Smith after another here lately. Now you bear a great resemblance to... Mr. Smith disentangled himself gently from Father's genealogical inquiries and followed me upstairs. Mealtimes, he said. That's a favorite hour for a raid, also the middle of the night. He strode from room, he strode from room to room, pointing everywhere to evidence that more than three people lived in the house. Watch waste, bas waste baskets and ashtrays. He paused in a bedroom door. If the raid comes at night, they must not only take their sheets and blankets, but get the mattresses turned. That's the Estes' favorite trick, feeling for a warm spot on a bed. Mr. Smith stayed for lunch. There were eleven of us at the table that day, including a Jewish lady who had arrived the night before, and a Gentile woman and her small daughter, members of our underground, who acted as escorts. The three of them were leaving for a farm in Brabant right after lunch. Betsy had just passed around a stew so artfully prepared you scarcely missed the meat when, without warning, Mr. Smith leaned back in his chair and pushed the button below the window. Above us, the buzzer sounded. People sprang to their feet, snatching up glasses and plates, scrambling for the stairs, while the cat clawed halfway up the curtain in consternation. Cries of faster, not so loud, and you're spilling it, reached us as Father Betsy and I hastily rearranged table and chairs to look like a lunch for three in progress. No, leave my place, Mr. Smith instructed. Why shouldn't you have a guest for lunch? The lady and the little girl could have stayed, too. At last we were seated again, and silence reigned upstairs. The whole process had taken four minutes. A little later we, a little later, we were all gathered again around the dining room table. Mr. Smith set out before him the incriminating evidence he had found. Two spoons and a piece of carrot on the stairs, pipe ashes in an unoccupied bedroom. Everyone looked at Yusi, who blushed to the tips of his large ears. Also those, he pointed to the hats of mother and daughter still dangling from the pegs on the dining room wall. You have to, if you have to hide, stop and think what you arrived with, besides which you're all simply too slow. The next night I sounded the alarm again, and this time we shaved a minute 33 seconds off our run. By our fifth trial, we were down to, in, down to two minutes. We never did achieve Pickwick's ideal under a minute, but with practice we learned to jump up from whatever we were doing and get to those, get those who had to hide in the secret room in 70 seconds. Father Tuss and I worked on stalling techniques, which we would use if the Gestapo came through the shop door. Betsy invented a similar strategy for a side door. With those delaying tactis tactics, we hoped we could gain a life-saving 70 ticks off the second hand. Because the drills 
struck so close to the fear that haunted each of our guests, never spoke and always present. We tried to keep these times from becoming altogether serious, like a game, we tell each other, a race to beat our own record. One of our group owned the bakery in the next street. Early in the month, I would deposit a supply of sugar coupons with him. Then when I decided it was time for a drill, I would go to him for a bag of cream puffs, an inexpressible treat in whose sweetless an inexpressible treat in those sweetless days, to be secreted in my workbench and brought out as a reward for a successful practice. Each time the order of cream puffs was larger, for by now, in addition to the workers whom we wanted to initiate into the system, we had three more permanent boarders Tia de Costa, Meta Monsanto, and Mary Itali. Mary Itali. At seventy six, the oldest of our guests was also the one who posed the greatest problem. The moment Mary stepped through our door, I heard the asthmatic wheezing, which had made our other hosts unwilling to take her in. Since her ailment co compromised the safety, safety of the others, we took up the problem in caucus. The seven most concerned, Yusi, Jop, Hank, Leander, Mita, Tia, and Mary herself, joined Father Betsy and me in Tante John's front room. There is no sense in pretending, I began. Mary has a difficulty, especially after climbing stairs that could put you all in danger. In the silence that followed, Mary's labored breathing sounded especially loud. Can I speak? Yusi asked. Of course. It seems to me that we're all here in your house because of some difficulty or other. We're the orphan children, the ones nobody else wanted. Any one of us is jeopardizing all the others. I vote that Mary stay. Good, said lawyer Hank. Let's put it to the vote. Hands began rising, but Mary was struggling to speak. Secret ballot, she brought out at last. No one should be embarrassed. Hank brought a sheet of paper from the desk in the next room and tore it into nine small strips. You too, he said, handing ballots to Betsy, father, and me. If we're discovered, you suffer the same as us. He handed around pencils. Mark, no, if it's too great a risk. Yes, if you think she belongs here. For a moment, pencils scratched. Then Hank collected the folded ballots. He opened them in silence and then reached over and dropped them into Mary's lap. Nine little scraps of paper, nine times the word, yes. And so our family was formed. Others stayed with us a day or a week. But these seven remained, the nucleus of our happy household. That I could have been happy at such a time and in such circumstances was largely a tribute to Betsy, because our guests' physical lives were so very restricted. Evenings, under Betsy's direction, became the door to the wide world, Sometimes we had concerts, with Lean Dirt on the violin, and Tia, a truly accompl accomplished musician on the piano. Or Betsy would announce an evening of Vondel, the Dutch Shakespeare. With each of us reading a part, one night a week, we talked. she talked Yusi into giving Hebrew lessons. Another night, Meta taught Italian. The evening's activity had to be kept brief because the city now had electricity only a short while each night, and candles had to be hoarded for emergencies. When the lamps flickered and dimmed, we would wind back down to the dining room where my bicycle was set up on its stand. One of us would climb onto it and others taking chairs, and then, while the rider pedaled furiously to make the headlight glow bright, someone would pick up the chapter from the night before. We changed cyclist and reader often as legs or voice grew tired, reading our way through histories, novels, plays. Father always went upstairs after prayers at 9.15, but the rest of us lingered, reluctant to break the cycle. Sorry to see the evening end. Oh, well, said Yusi would say, hopefully, as we started at last to our rooms. Maybe there'll be a drill tonight. I haven't had a cream puff in nearly a week. Have a good day, friends.